Amityville Horror. This is a box set I got of the original film and the 2005 remake. It's actually kind of nice. I bet you can't tell on this camera, but the, the house and the title here, it's like raised, you know, you can feel it by running your fingers across. Okay, we are going to start by looking at the original, and this is the two disc special edition. The newlywed Lull, sorry, Lutz family are moving into a new house. It's a big house and it's too expensive for them even though it costs less than it originally originally did because sick people were murdered roughly 13 months earlier. As the real estate agent takes them through this house that they probably shouldn't buy because they can't afford it, she's occasionally interrupted by fairly awkward flashbacks to the six people being murdered with a rifle. At one point, this may have actually been an error on the DVD, but she actually froze in midair for a second or two, then it went to the gunshots, then it went back to her and like unpaused her. Anyway, early on Lois Lane here is pondering, I wish all these people hadn't died here. It's, it's not that she's a bad actress, it's probably just a really lousy line. Anyway, the way it comes across is as if she's staring at a pool of blood that she's going to have to be cleaning up before they can really move in. George tries to calm her down by saying that houses don't have memories, and he should know because he tried to teach his old house plenty of stuff and he just kept forgetting it. So anyway, they move in and immediately strange occurrences begin to happen. One of the first is that two minutes after George literally says, yeah, are they the children too close to the water, we cut to them and see that they are in fact so close to the water that if they were any closer they would be wading in it. Wading. Anyway. They don't really do anything in response to these occurrences, but I don't know, maybe it is just because all that really seems to happen is that the toilets start to, you know, cough up black goo when they flush. Actually, at first it's just the one toilet, and then they do the brilliant thing that you should always do if one of your toilets is malfunctioning, and go to the other one and flush it so that that one will have a problem too. You know, instead of just you know, writing on a piece of paper, please don't use this, we may have plumbing issues. They by the way, never call a plumber. We never see it, at least. Another issue is a large collection of flies in a room. I don't know. And then the phone doesn't appear to be working. They're, they're static. At least there is when Kathy Lois Lane is trying to call the priest that she's known for years. Then they're static. We never find out if there's always static. And again, we're never shown them contacting the phone agency. I realize that they couldn't call, but still. And and this goes on for, you know, weeks. I mean, that's not how long the movie lasts, although at times it can feel like it is. But, you know, they never really seem to do anything. Also, this priest is supposedly Kathy's idea of how they could maybe take care of the whole situation with the haunted house that they're now living in. But, she basically always just tries to call them, even though that has no reaction. You know, 
I've actually heard that the definition of someone being insane is that they keep, keep doing the same thing and expecting a different result each time. So she might be certifiable. Anyway, no disrespect to the real Kathy Lutz. I don't believe that what you think happened happened, but that's an entirely different topic. Anyway, the woman never seems to leave the house and just go to try to meet him. Almost never, anyway. I think I've pretty much already hinted at what the main problems here are. There's really no consequence. No one reacts to what happens. I think the term is masturbatory. The writer and director, probably, just really wanted to put a lot of haunting type stuff up on the screen, into the film. They don't really have any coherence to these events. There's nothing that really binds this whole thing together. It's just a series of odd little occurrences that no one reacts to. No one does anything. I'm sorry, but if my house was haunted for weeks, I would maybe consider just springing for a single night at a hotel. Think things through. See if bad stuff will still happen when you're away from the house. I mean, it's not like bad stuff was happening before they entered the house. And another thing is, this really only works if you believe in it. This movie is for two groups of people, those who already believe and those who are 100% certain, consciously or not, that they are going to believe. These are the people. You're not going to be convinced by this. I certainly wasn't. Now, before you believe that I'm just some sort of anti-supernatural horror fantasy film viewer, Perhaps I am to some extent because I don't believe that it's real, but I have enjoyed several of these films. I'd have to say the one I enjoyed the most was Paranormal Activity, but, you know, that one is recent, and here are some titles that were from the same period. This movie was from 1979. Six years prior to that, The Exorcist came out. That one beats this by miles. I mean, that one, whether or not you believe in what you're seeing, it's shocking. It's effective, you know. We've got Linda Blair giving a really good performance at age 12. We've got genuinely terrifying and brutal images. Then there is, I know a lot of people don't like this, but The Shining, it is better than this. It, and, not really a haunted house story, but Rosemary's Baby, also story about, you know, Supernatural, much, much better. That one is also one of the best of these kind of, and it isn't just because it was Roman Polanski and it was clearly a cathartic experience for him to direct that. It's just really good. I suppose those might be about it. The th w one really big similarity between this and The Shining is that both of them have the husband of the family going insane, being affected, affected by the house, and being a genuine threat to their family. Jack Nicholson did a fantastic job. James Brolin could have. The guy can act, and he could back then. It's not that, but it's that they keep going back and forth. 
they can't decide if he's being possessed or if he's just really a nice, charming guy. It goes back and forth, and in general, for most of this movie, you can't tell who you're supposed to be caring about, who is currently possessed or affected by the house, and who is currently in danger. I get that all of them are just normal human beings, but it's a horror film. We're supposed to have a fairly clear idea of where the threat is coming from. This seriously lacks a real, I don't want to use the word personified, but just a real sense of threat. All we have is this house, and this house does nothing other than mess up the plumbing and send house flies at people. A couple of times. That's pretty much it. The effects are admittedly pretty good. The blood looks right. The acting of the two leads is pretty good, and I would also say on the whole, other than the children, it is pretty good. The characters aren't terribly developed, and really aren't all that interesting. I don't know, maybe it was directed in that kind of old-school way where we're just kind of supposed to care about the characters because they're the characters, you know. In fact, several of the characters, I mean, suddenly, George's partner from work shows up, and there's not really a lot for him to... He's pretty much just there so that he can take the words of skeptical audience members into his mouth and be slammed for it because how dare you bring logic and rationality into this movie you know because it's not like all this stuff that happens is just weird and not actually particularly harming anyone or very clearly being supernatural. Anyway, and then there's, I guess it's his wife, she's psychic or at least receptive to it, and that's it. She's just there to be the psychic who can go into the house and then it's just cheap. Other than being really willing to believe in what happens in this movie. I can't really see how anyone can really overlook all the flaws this has. It is not good storytelling. There is so much setup and absolutely no payoff. Things just... I mean, hints are dropped and nothing is done to follow up on these plot threads. It's really quite frustrating. It's a very unsatisfying movie experience. And it is 110 minutes long. That's way too long to spend on a movie that basically doesn't deliver what it's what it promises. There's also some odd filming. At one point they actually film a stairwell and we hear someone walking up it, but we see the empty, the top couple of steps on the stairwell being empty for several seconds, and then finally we see the person finishing walking up the stairs. Who films someone going up the stairs in such a way? Then there are problems with headroom. I think that is the technical term it was when I was learning about this stuff. For those of you who don't know, headroom is the amount of space above the head. In this movie, sometimes there's too little headroom and the top of the person's head gets cut off, and at other times there's way too much headroom and it just looks awkward. It looks like there's supposed to be 
something above their head or something. I will admit that there are also some effectively creepy shots. When this uses sound to try to, you know, scare us, it basically doesn't work. I don't know what exactly... It's just... I think what may have happened here is they followed the book... I haven't read it, really don't intend to. It is a little interesting that the book on the cover says true story. Then they made the movie and the tagline says the, the book that has captivated millions of audiences, people are gullible, is now reality. Which means that it went from being real to being real again, supposedly. I don't know. The reason I'm telling you this is I'm procrastinating, I really don't want to be talking about this movie. Anyway, I think they maybe just followed the book way too closely, and the things that the people described, you know what, maybe it would be scary if it happened and you couldn't really find the explanation, but it just doesn't work well in this movie. At one point, we hear a sound that is supposed to... Okay, more than one point, I'll give several examples. We hear sounds that are supposed to really unease us. At, at one point it's, I think, supposed to be a child giggling, at least that's what the subtitling told me, and eventually I could sort of hear it. Honestly, it sounds like someone is spilling water onto a synthesizer playing the sound of children giggling. And you probably already have heard the whole thing about Get Out, I knew of this from the Simpsons episode, one of the first Treehouse of Horror episodes, possibly actually the first. And there, it really worked. You know, you have Harry Shearer, who already has a pretty cool voice, doing the Get Out. And in this, it's like, I don't know, maybe it's like... The demonic voice from The Exorcist only bitchified, you know, it's just really... I would try to reproduce it, but I would hate for my vocal cords to die and for that to be the last thing I ever try to... the last, you know, tonal whatever that I ever actually tried to go for, so I think it's in the trailer. Even when I watched the trailer, it just did not work. And then there is a bit where we hear music, and it's like a drum beat, and it's like, you know, for when soldiers go marching, you know, in the old days, you know, the whole with the thin little drumsticks on the drum that they had here in front, and I don't have a problem with that kind of music, but it's not scary! It's just not! It doesn't matter that it starts out being, you know, kind of low, and then as the character approaches the source, which is of course invisible, it gets louder. It doesn't matter! It's not scary! It's just strange! I really think some artistic license, some, you know, creative leeway, leeway would really have helped them out here. I suppose one should give this credit for some subtlety. It does not show outright ghosts or demons except for that, I'm not going to mention it here, but I'll go into it in the spoilers video, the thoughts on video. It just is not that good unless you 
fully believe that what the real life Lutzes claim actually happened and that and if this actually is a pretty direct adaptation of that which I don't know and I really don't care there is yeah I'll go into that in the spoilers as this is a two disc DVD set and special edition no less it comes with three documentaries two of these are episodes of a history channel show called History's Mysteries. Um, Amityville Haunting and Amityville Horror or Hoax. I would kind of say that in the Horror or Hoax one they've kind of already made up their mind. The Haunting itself, if you want the facts, it seems like it actually delivers. Now, these are the only two episodes of the show that I've watched, I think. So, if you haven't watched the show either, and you're intending to watch these two, be forewarned, the reenactments are unintentionally goofy. And then we have, for God's sake, Get Out. I would say, just for your own sake, Get Out. I'm not entirely sure how it's going to help, you know, the man upstairs for these five people to leave a house, but anyway... That one is just kind of meh. All three are, really. The History's Mysteries ones are really only good if you care a lot about the idea that something went on there. Although I will say that some of the story is interesting, at least. And the For God's Sakes Get Out is basically Lois Lane and James Brolin sitting down in separate interviews and talking about what it was like to work on the film. They do at least admit that they really don't believe in it, and then they talk a little bit about that there were some troubles when they first met because she's kind of improvisational or was back then, and he's maybe more planned. That's about it. They talk a little bit about that, oh, the director was nice and he, you know, he let you be yourself. And that's kind of it. You know, it's not a making of, it's just these two people sitting down and talking about, you know, working on the movie. And I don't know, I don't even think it would be that impressive to you, even if you loved the movie. Then we have seven and a half minutes of radio spots. Not seven and a half, three and a half, because there are seven radio spots and all of them are around 30 seconds in length. You'll, you might like them if you like the movie. Five and a half minutes sneak preview of the 2005 remake, the original trailer, ah, and then an audio commentary and an introduction by the same guy to the audio commentary. The guy's name is Hans Holzer, I guess, from Austria or something like that, and he believes that it actually happened, so he spends much of the commentary track talking about how they embellished on the story here and there, and occasionally making a little joke. At least he does talk disparagingly about organized religion. That's nice, at least. That's about it. It's actually kind of disappointing, both because at first he sounds like he is a rational human being, but also because I would have thought that it'd be fun, you know, listening to this nutcase, but 
really isn't all that much. But yeah, all in all, if you already believe, or you probably are the type to believe, I mean, maybe you don't already believe in this exact kind of, but, you know, maybe you believe in astrology, or, you know, horoscopes, some kind of numerology, stuff like that, then you might enjoy the movie. If not, st stick with the actual classics of this sort of subgenre. Heck, the original, I think it's just called The Haunting, is also quite good. That one is from like the 50s or so, and it's directed by, I think his last name is Wise, I don't remember his first name at the moment. The man who also gave us the original The Day the Earth Stood Still, I haven't seen the remake, don't particularly intend to, don't see a need to remake that movie, although from what I hear the moral in the new one isn't bad. And he also gave us Star Trek motion picture. Well, we can try to forgive that, can't we? I think that was the same guy at least. Rest in peace, Wise. You did good work. Yeah, that's about it. So, that was my spoiler for review of the Amityville Horror 1979. Hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you next time.